My name is Hussam Abdina. I'm a bioinformatician at uh, Genome DX. Uh, what I will present today how we use uh, H2O for genomic application. So, at first, I will talk, uh, give some background about Genome DX. I will talk about some of the cancer and genomics and the genomic information we extract, some of our prostate cancer solutions, and why we used H2O and some of the applications we developed using H2O. First, uh, Genome DX is a clinical genomics company that was founded in 2007 with the aim to improve uh, uh, the practice of urological oncology with uh, using genomics. Our clinical labs are located in San Diego and our informatics labs are located in Vancouver. What we're trying to do is trying to use like the advances in machine learning and the statistical algorithms to develop clinical tests that help uh, physicians uh, make decisions. Uh, we, we also like uh, just combine different algorithms together. We we try we don't we we trying to use of the use all of these machine learning to also understand the cancer biology. So one of our like Medicare approved tests is uh, decipher metastasis signature, and it was like uh, validated on more than 20 peer reviewed papers. Also, uh, it's tested in over 5,000 patients. Also, we have our Decipher Grid platform, which is a data sharing platform for all the Decipher users and all our col uh, collaborators. <clears throat> Cancer is a genomic disease. It, it happens due to mutation in, in the DNA. In usual, like normal cells, DNA has all the information to, uh, for cellular function. What happens, it gets copied to our RNA, which different concentration of RNA will, will produce different uh, levels of protein, what happens in cancer that these mutations in DNA cause different alternation in the concentration of RNA, which alters the production of protein, which consequently will result like in cells growing uh, faster and uh, like damaging neighboring cells. Cancer itself is a complex disease. There is like many subtypes of cancer. There is indolent cancer, aggressive cancer, like cancer which is sensitive to radiation or like resistant to hormone treatment. So understanding the genomics behind cancer will help us understand how like each of these subtypes will behave. So usual, what, like in uh, Genome DX, we try to measure the concentration of RNA. So if a patient goes through biopsy or surgery, we, we, we extract sample of their uh, cancer tissue. We, we, we extract the RNA from that. Then we use microarray technology to get the expression of G, these genes. Or like uh, we, we get around like 46,000 uh, expre gene expressions from this data. All of that goes to our decipher grid which is based on the collaboration with top researchers in, in, this, in the States and worldwide. We, we also share this data with all, all our collaborators to, to accelerate the cancer genomics innovation. One of our focus areas at GenomeDx is prostate cancer. In 2015, it's estimated there will be more than 220,000 new cases, and uh, there, it's like the second Lead, uh, lead, leading cause of related to cancer death. Even though like there's 200,000 and it's second leading cause, there's also like 27,000 deaths from it. So the percentage is small. So a lot of these patients who will be diagnosed with cancer, they will go through different kinds of treatment. Some of them is not necessary to them. So what we're trying to do at uh, Genome DX is trying to use all of these machine, advanced machine learning algorithms to come with more accurate estimates of patient risk, use these uh, uh, genomic tests we develop to help support like decision making regarding their treatment. For example, some patients may don't need any treatment. They can be on active surveillance. Some others will, may don't need even hormone treatment. Some, some, of these, some of these subtypes of cancer if they are like given hormone treatment, they become more aggressive and they lead for like patient to, to die from, the can from their cancer. So if we don't give them that treatment, it actually is helping them. And if we give it to them, we are like, instead of trying to cure it, we are trying to make it more aggressive and they die from it. So what we are trying to do is 
reduce the side effects of treatment and also reduce the cost of treatment. One of like uh, our products in that field is the Decipher test. It's Medicare approved and it has proven that it can help in uh, may, uh, deciding late or early or late radiation therapy with, if, they be, if patients will benefit from them. So why we get interested into H2O? Like usually what we're trying to do is always, always use whatever machine learning algorithm is available out there, applied into different fields. We take it, we use it for our data. And one of the things we, we get interested into is using deep learning. And I found like H2O has implemented it. Also, when I start using H2, I found like they have all of these algorithms ready to use. I just plug in my data, my tuning parameters, and run it, and it was uh, giving some good results. Also, I, ha I found they have this uh, web user interface where I can, like, building the model, I can see how each of these cross validations is performing. And the most important, like, uh, they implemented many algorithms into the same package. Sometimes I used uh, to face problems with incompatibility between packages. However, like H2O implemented the most, like three I used, it's like GLM, deep learning, and random forest. So like an example of the uh, image we get out of our microarray scanners, like each pixel in this image corresponds to a expression of the gene. So when I, uh, we started like uh, looking at these images, Coming from a um, computer vision image processing background, I was like I used also like convolutional neural nets, deep deep convolutional nets. I, I thought like they, these ideas will be useful. I don't have to do feature uh, engineering. I can use it there. However, like the images we get from the scanners are a little bit different. Uh, pixels are not correlated. These genes are placed on, placed on this microarray randomly, so you, we can't extract any spatial information from these images. There also, like we have around like 46,000 features. Each pixel is a feature, so it's high dimensional. We have to reduce this dimensionality. But we were still interested in it. We wanted to, to explore this nonlinear relationship between these genes. We, we tried using linear models and they're performing good, but we still like think there is some nonlinear relationship between these genes that can help us to improve the performance. Also, like one of the questions we're still trying to answer is, can we use like uh, more features and can like the deep learning help us understand the biology in that? Uh, I will like stop talking about deep learning. I will start to show you some of the results we have. First, I tried to use different packages that implemented deep neural networks. However, like I first have to reduce the features to around 100. There were no grid search in them. The cross-validation was around 0.5. I was not able to use any of these uh, models. Like all, all, all my cross-validation results were like 0.5. However, like following Kaggle competition, I found that uh, H2O has the deep learning. I get interested into it. I did the same filtering process. I got, put my data into it. I was able to get good results out of it. One of the applications we use it for is to develop a tumor Gleason grade classifier. So I will give a little bit of feedback about tumor Gleason grade. It's a scoring system for cancer tissue based on the microscopic appearance of tissue. So image, the, the image on right showing like uh, how they usually give the scores for them, like one, like scores of one or two are given to like cells are well differentiated. If they are moderately differentiated, they will get like a, a score of three. If they're poorly differentiated, they, they get score four or five. Uh, Gleason grade itself is associated with more aggressive cancer. Also, patients or men who have higher Gleason grade, they are more probable to get hormone treatment. However, like there's some caveats with Gleason grade. Uh, it depends on the pathologist's experience. More experienced pathologists will get more consistent results and more accurate results. However, less experienced pathologists will give you less accurate and consistent results. And mostly like uh, the, these borderline cases are like differentially interpreted. So at uh, like three and four, these are like where pathologists sometimes don't agree. Also what happens usually when a patient get uh, like some clinical risk that they have uh, prostate cancer, 
they go and get biopsy samples. At the biopsy sample time, they give them a Gleason, uh, like they give them a score for their uh, Gleason grade. So after that, they go through surgery and they extract the prostate out of them. What happens at that time is that the Gleason is totally different than the Gleason they gave them at the time of biopsy. So they underestimated the risk of the patient. Or usually what happens, it gets upgraded from three to four or five. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to develop like, uh, a genomic uh, test that's accurate and robust and more accurate than biopsy Gleason itself. So what we did, we have like our decipher grid, we have around like 7,000 patients into it. We extracted uh, 1,500 patients, the data of 1,500 patients. We, we separated them into two classes, training and testing. Even those, like in each of these training and testing, they were like we defined two classes for uh, classification problem, like patients who have Gleason grade three, patients who have Gleason grade four or five. These numbers may be like for other parts in this that H2 award is small. However, like uh, in the genomic field, especially for prostate cancer, clinical trials are run around like maximum two, three hundred patients they have. We are having here around 1,000 patients just to train our model and around 500 patients to test it. <clears throat> so we have our like 990 patients. However, we have like 46,000 genes. Not all of these genes are features. Let's, let me refer to them as features. Not all of these features get uh, expressed in prostate cancer. So if we go and look at these images that the scanner produce, a lot of these genes are just background noise. So if we filter them out, we can reduce the amount, like the features. However, even if we remove this back, features that are background noise, they are still, uh, like we will get around 4,000 features that are differentially expressed or like that have some expression. Therefore, we did some univariate analysis to find out uh, differentially expressed genes and we ended up with around 79 or 79 features. So we did like, we used H2O grid search with tenfold cross validation. We used the rectifier drop out. We optimized number of layers, number of hidden, uh, like uh, size of these hidden neurons. We found that three layers were performing the best and the cross-validation results. And what we did, we locked this model, passed it to our like uh, biostatistics team. And they did the analysis on our testing data. So they found that AUC was 77. Also, we were like trying to find if like these new algorithms will do better than some of the genomic classifiers we have. What we did, uh, we found like it's 77, like genomic classifier one and two was not doing good, even like, uh, and even it performed better than the biopsy Gleason, it was 72. So one of, another problem like we have is uh, metastatic disease. Cancer itself spreads out of prostate. It goes to other parts of the body and it becomes lethal. What, and they refer to it as metastatic disease. And, like after surgery, very few men, like around like up to 50% of them will have like clinical risk that indicate they have, uh, they will develop metastatic disease. However, very few of them will develop it and die from it. So one good advantage of the Gleason grade that it's a surrogate of meta uh, lethal uh, cancer or related prostate cancer, metastatic prostate cancer. So what we did, we used that same model and we, we run it on one of our case cohort design studies in our database. Uh, patients in red are those patients who have metastatic disease. These are their scores. Patients who have no metastasis are like in blue. This is time dependent problem. So we did calculate it at time dependent AUC. It was around 73 and also we looked at the survival analysis. So what we did, we separated it like it's a classification. We have patients who have high score or, and low score. We looked at uh, their survival analysis. So the y-axis is the probability of metastasis-free survival. The x-axis is the time from surgery to metastasis. At five years, the vertical dash dotted line, 
we found that patients who have high score, their probability of surviving without, de without developing the disease as, is 75%, and it's statistically lower than patients who have low score. These analyses are important for like, clin clin like doctors when they look at them, because they want to know like, how accurate the model is in predicting if the, the patients will get this uh, metastatic disease or not. I will quickly go through this. We, what we want to do at GenomeDx, we just don't want to uh, do some univariate analysis to find differentially expressed genes and plug them into models. What we want to do is we want to use all of these, as much as of these genes we have, to be able to un, like, see how these genes perform or like, interact with each other to predict our clinical outcome, like metastasis. So, uh, when I was developing the model, I was talking to Arno, I think, Arno, and uh, it, it took me like around one, uh, like three, four hours to develop one model. And if I increased the number of features, it was getting to 14 hours. So he suggested not to use grid search and just to use random search. I was like skeptical at the time because it's like just random. However, I used 250 features and 500 features and I was able to get similar results to the results I used in the previous model. So what we're trying to do, uh, in conclusion, we applied these advanced deep learning algorithms to our genomic data. We used like H2O deep learning model, outperformed other genomic classifier models like they were developed using random forest and KNN. Also what we're trying to do in the future is incorporate more of these genomic features into our model building and analysis. And we want to exploit these nonlinear relationships that <coughs> deep learn or deep neural nets can take advantage of. And at the end, maybe like if we use some like a deep, uh, deep belief networks, we can help, it can help us to understand the biology more. Especially now we are getting a lot of uh, data, like we are getting hundreds of patients every day, and like that dimensional problem will not be uh, there anymore. Then I would like to thank everyone at GenomeDx who helped me to make this work possible, and thank for everyone for listening. Are there any questions? So you mentioned your data has a um, high dimension issue. So basically you have uh, fewer rows and uh, way more um, columns, columns yeah. right? So. When we have this kind of situation, people will usually think about a sparse regression, like uh, Rage or Lasso. Have you uh, tested, um, the, uh, have you compared this um, sparse regression and this deep learning, like speed-wise, accuracy-wise, uh, any comparisons between these two approaches? Uh, I'm not sure if I got, but just you're asking if, like, if you, we can compare Lasso to deep learning? Yeah, kind of. Uh, one of these models that I compared them is uh, Lasso, like generalized linear model, and we used the GLMNet package. However, it didn't perform as good as deep learning for these applications. Fortunately, we're running out of time. That's the, all the time we have. But thanks a lot, Hassam, okay, for thank the you. wonderful talk. Thank you.